And last class, uh, we learned how to use the epsilon NTU method with the tables, right? How to use the equations from the tables. And we said that uh, the equations from tables are pretty useful, especially when we are um, doing iterations, right? Or when we uh, can input the, the equation in a program. Uh, but if we are just reading one point for solving a problem like the one we are about to solve, it's easier to go and check the graphs, right? So we have here hot oil that is going to be cooled by water in a one shell pass, A2 passes, heat exchanger. The tubes are thin walled and are made of copper with an internal diameter of 1.4 centimeters. The length of each tube pass in the heat exchanger is five meters. Um, that is, a, is a, a rational number, right? Remember last time we were looking at a double pipe of around 100 meters that was not pretty useful. So we not need to organize in a kind of geometry like this, five meters with multiple passes. And the overall heat transfer coefficient is 310. Uh, so we have the overall heat transfer coefficient, which simplifies um, the problem, right? Because we don't need to calculate the convective heat transfer coefficients from our four set convection correlations. Uh, water flows uh, through the tube at a rate of 0.2 kilograms per second, and the oil through the shell at a rate of 0.3 kilograms per second. The water and the oil enter at temperatures 20 and 150, respectively. Determine the rate of heat transfer in the heat exchanger and the outlet temperatures of the water and the oil. So again, even if I just give you this problem like that, you will realize that you will need to use epsilon NTU, right? Why? Because you have two missing temperatures, the two outlets, okay? So if you don't want to use epsilon NTU, you might need to use an um, iterative LMTD, right? But the easy way to go right now is to use the epsilon NTU. So even if you don't know which method to use, you will know um, by the problem statement that epsilon NTU might be the most reasonable choice. So we know that oil is to be cooled by water. Uh, we know the mass flow rate and the inlet temperature, so we have two temperatures, but we don't know the rate of heat transfer or the outlet temperatures, and that's actually what the problem is asking us to solve for. So the problem says we have thin wall, uh, thin wall tubes, right? So the thickness of the tubes is negligible. Um, also, the heat transfer uh, from hot fluid is going to be equal to the heat transfer to the cold fluid, right? Whatever the hot loses, the cold gains, right? So first of all, what is the first step in epsilon anti U? Determine the cis or the heat capacity rate, right? So we are going to determine first the heat capacity rate and determine which one is the smallest one, right? So the heat capacity rate of the hot fluid is the mass flow rate of the hot fluid times the CP of the hot fluid. Right, so 0 0.3 uh, times 2.13 equals 0 0.639. We repeat the same analysis now with the cold current. Heat capacity rate of the cold fluid equals mass flow rate of the cold fluid times CP of the cold fluid. 0 0.2 times 4.18. That gives us 0.836. Now we compare the two values, 0 0.6 versus 0 0.8, which is the smallest one, the hot heat capacity rate. So the hot heat capacity rate is what we are now to rename as the heat capacity rate minimum, right? The 0.6. Then if you remember for both charts and tables, we need to calculate some intermediate quantities that are C and also the NTU. So is what I'm doing next because I need both to read the plots, okay? So what is C? If you don't remember what is C, you can go to your plot or to your table and you will check that C equals C minimum divided by C maximum, or the heat capacity rate minimum value versus the C max, right? So it's going to be 0.6 divided by 0.8. So we have C defined already, 0.764. Um, I'm going to calculate the maximum heat transfer rate. Why? Because I needed to calculate the actual, right? The actual is going to be what? Epsilon times the maximum, right? That's why I need the maximum. And epsilon, I'm going to get it from the graph, right? 
So let's get the maximum so we can have it ready for when we read epsilon from the graph, we multiply by the maximum and we will have the actual, right? So let's uh, calculate the maximum heat transfer rate. So we said that the maximum heat transfer rate is calculated with the minimum heat capacity rate or the smallest value, right? That in this case is the 0.6, the hot one, times the maximum temperature difference occurring in the heat exchanger. That is going to be the difference between hot and cold in, hot in minus cold in, right? So we have the Qmax for this heat exchanger being 83.1 kilowatts. In order to calculate the missing intermediate, temperature, intermediate quantity, right, to determine the epsilon from the table, we need to calculate the surface area, right, to calculate the NTU, the number of transfer units. So the surface area is going to be pi dl, right, times the number of tube, so a times pi dl. Uh, remember that if we don't if we don't have the length, in this case it says the tube length is five meters. We do calculations per one meter length, right? It's typically a common assumption we have been we have been doing through all the course. So uh, the overall heat transfer coefficient that was given as data times um, the surface area times or uh, divided by C minimum, sorry. So this give us 0.85. What would be next? By epsilon or the effectiveness from the figure. So look in your textbook for the right figure for this heat exchanger that in this case would be figure 1020. You have C and we, you have NTU, so you can read epsilon or the effectiveness from figure 1020. So I'm going to figure 1020, that is this one to your right side. This was taken from the other textbook, but it's the same thing essentially. So uh, we have NTU number of transfer units equals 0.85, so a little bit before one. And uh, we have the ratio of C, C minimum, C maximum equals 0 0.7, uh, 0.76, so it could be a little bit like down the 0.75, between 0.75 and one, right? Um, so if we go all the way to the left, we will get around 47, 46. And I know these plots are not that very, um, very easy to read, especially if you are in the lower range area where all the lines are all together, right? But if you are unsure, you can always use a, uh, the proper equation from the table, okay? So this is just to do a rough estimate. So we have epsilon around 0 0.45, 0 0.46. Um, remember, that's a good reading. If you read 0.2, obviously it's not going to be a good reading, but you should be within range. And obviously your reading is going to impact the actual heat transfer, right? Uh, because you, you guys might have different readings during homeworks or exams. So this number, this epsilon, this effectiveness is going to change the answer a little bit, but you should be within range, right? So epsilon 0.47 then from the figure times Q max, right? That would be the actual heat transfer. So we have the actual heat transfer be 39.1 kilowatts. So we have the actual heat transfer rate. We are ready to get the outlet temperatures from energy balance, like we did for the other method for when using the, the tables, right? So uh, we are going to get here the outlet temperatures of the cold and hot fluid streams. So heat transfer rate equals heat capacity of the, of the cold times T cold out minus T cold in. So this is the balance on the cold stream, right? So we can get cold out, right? So we take cold out out of this equation. So cold out is going to be cold in plus heat transfer rate that we just calculate, the actual one, divided by the heat capacity, heat capacity rate of the cold fluid. We know the hot in, sorry, the cold in, that is 20 plus the actual that we just calculate, calculated, divided by the heat capacity rate of the cold. That gives me 66.8 Celsius. 
I repeat the same analysis, but with the hot stream, right? So heat transfer rate equals heat capacity rate of the hot, hot in minus hot out. I get hot out out of my balance equation for the hot stream, right? And I get this equation. Hot out equals hot in minus heat transfer rate, the actual one, divided by the heat capacity rate of the hot. So 150 minus 39 divided by 69.69 gives me 88.8. .8. So the temperature of the water will rise from 20 to 66.8, right? The outlet that just I calculated here. As it cools the oil from 150, right, in to 88. Okay, so let's start uh, looking at the design. And in this lecture, I'm going to start covering basics on heat exchanger design. And I need that you read carefully the chapter 12 the current, from the current textbook, uh, because in this, in this course, we will be using the current method to design a heat exchanger. And um, don't worry, we are going to go through an example so you can see how it is done. And once we go through the example, I require that you have your chapter handy and also a calculator because we are going to go through the example so you can follow the calculations and see how iterations are done in order to design a heat exchanger. And that is what you are required to do in your design project. So it is important that once we reach the example problem, um, you have all your materials ready so you can follow the design. So I'm going to go through basics and most details are in the chapter 12. I so we are going to focus in shell and tube heat exchangers. Why? Because shell and tube heat exchangers account for a, about 85% of heat exchangers um, that are employed in industry ref in oil refining, chemical, petrochemical, and power companies around the world. Why this heat, heat exchanger is so much preferred? Well, because it can be designed for almost any duty and duty is heat transfer rate. So when we are talking about um, design of heat exchangers and you see this word duty, duty means heat transfer rate. It's what we have been calling heat transfer rate up to now. So they can be designed for almost any duty with a very wide range of temperatures and pressures, can be built in many materials. There are many suppliers available. They can be repaired by non-specialists and the design methods and mechanical codes have been established for many years of experience. So it's something that we already have well established. And this is a shell and heat tube heat exchanger that we have already seen uh, while solving problems with LMTD method and NTU method, right? So shell and tube heat exchangers essentially consist of a tube bundle or a bundle of tubes in a large cylindrical shell. And typically we employ baffles to support the tubes and to direct the shell side fluid into multiple cross flow. That's why we need a correction factor to account for all these flow patterns developed through the shell, right? These are typical, um, typical sizes of, or, or typical uh, parameters of shell and tube heat exchangers. Maximum pressure in the shell around 4,500 pounds a square inch absolute, tube 20,000, a PSI, temperature range um, can be from minimum one, minus 150 Fahrenheit to 1100 Fahrenheit. Um, fluids, we can, we can use a wide variety of fluids in these heat exchangers. And typically the right selection of the material depends on the type of fluid we are passing. There's a, a, a very um, close relationship between the fluid and your chosen material, right? And um, they are available, these kind of uh, heat exchangers are available in a wide uh, range of materials. And typical size per unit range from these values in international system, 10 to 1000 meters square. However, these operation parameters can be extended with a special design and materials. So this is just to give you an idea. Um, the components, uh, the component parts of the shell and tube heat exchanger is obviously the shell, and typically they are up to a diameter of 24 inches. A steel pipe is generally used for the shell. Over 24 inch, the shells are made from roll steel plate. And standards for the shells are set by the Tubular Exchangers Manufacturer Association, TEMA. 
the tubes, as you can see, we have several uh, types of material constructions for the tubes, and this depends, the selection depends heavily on uh, the type of fluid you are using. And the materials range from low carbon steel, copper, to very, um, to very expensive materials, such as the titanium, inconel, and hastaloy. Common sizes range from uh, 5, 8 inches to 1.5 inches. And uh, this is just a part of a table, so you realize that we have tables to um, select, and this is what you are going to do in your design heat exchanger, you are going to select the sizes of the tubes you are going to put in the heat exchanger. And you have um, tables in the chapter 12 I share with you. Okay. Um, the component parts of the shell and, and tube heat exchanger are the tubes. Right, that's a very important, and you will do selection of the type of the tubes again for your design. So there are several variations, and just to give you an example, uh, we can have low fin tubing. And when we when we can use this low tube low fin tubing, well, uh, when we want to increase the surface area, and actually if you use this long fin tubing, you can increase the area from 50 to 250 percent, and also. Um, you can use when you expect a low H or convective heat transfer coefficient on the cell side, shell side relative to the tube side. Uh, another important component of the shell and tube heat exchanger is the tube sheet. The tube sheet helps us to hold the tubes in precise position relative to each other. And um, the, how to join tubes to the tube sheet? Well, they can be uh, welded when the materials can be weldable, right? And very important feature to have in mind about the tube sheet. The tube sheet not only keeps in place the tubes, right? But it's in contact with both fluids, the tube side and the shell side uh, fluids. So it must be compatible with both fluids. It's something that you need to have in mind, okay? However, in the cases when it is critical that the two fluids never come in contact, you might want to propose a double tube sheet. Okay? So that, that's the important part about the tube sheet. Or you check that it's compatible with both fluids, or you put a double, uh, a double sheet in case you don't want them to be in contact. Um, important about the how to organize or put patterns to the tubes in the shell and tube heat exchanger is uh, first of all to go through the common arrangement. And we already more or less talked about this a little bit when we talk about um, basics on shell and tubes. And we can have typically two main types of layouts, the triangular and the square, right? And the triangular, um, we can have a rotated triangular, right? That we are just rotating this first image here. And we can have also a square and rotated square. Remember that we define at that time that this distance is what we call the pitch. When to use uh, triangular? Well, triangular allow us to put more tubes because the packing is more tight, right? But again, they are difficult to clean because of the tight packing. So you need to be sure what kind of service this uh, kind of geometry can allow you to do without um, imposing any, any clogging or uh, reduction in the surface area by depositing or some other uh, effect. Um, so triangular tubes give more tubes in a given shell. A square tubes is going to give you fewer tubes in a given shell, but are easy to clean, right? So square layouts give cleaning lanes with closed pitch. And typically, this is what we use. And you will see other cases in the chapter 12. So typically, one inch tubes on a 1.25 inch pitch or 0.75 inch tubes on a, on a um, one inch pitch. The next important part of a shell and tube heat exchanger are the baffles. And the baffles have two, so, two main purposes. They support the tubes and prevent vibration. And they direct the flow of the shell side 
fluid back and forth across the two bundles. The baffle diameter must allow the bundle to slide into the shell, but close enough to prevent fluid bypass around the baffles. Thus the importance of the shell roundels. And um, so you have here different cuts, like not enough baffle cut, right? Because the fluid is here. The best baffle cut and too much baffle cut, right? And common, common uh, baffle cut, and again, you are going to use all these when you propose your heat exchanger because you have to propose what is the baffle cut you are going to use for your design. So you will be proposing everything from the size to the baffle cut. Uh, so typically for liquids, the baffle cut ranges between 20 and 25%, and for gases from 40 to 45%. And it's important to have in mind that baffles must overlap by at least one row for tube support, right? Like you can see here, the overlapping. Let's go through the next part of a shell and tube heat exchanger. Remember, we are going part by part. And I know this is too much information. That's why I need that you read also your chapter 12. So, okay, so the tube bundle, it's also an important part of the shell and tube heat exchanger. And we can have different ways of um, have the tube bundle. We can have a fixed tube sheet. In this case, the tube sheets are welded to the shell. What are the advantages? They are low cost construction. And you can have a better seal between the shell side and the tube side fluid. What are the disadvantages? The outside of the tubes cannot be cleaned mechanically because it's welded, right? Um, so it, you need to be very careful with the chosen fluids for this kind of tube sheet fixer. A thermal stress cannot be tolerated. And the role of some difference in temperature between the shell side and tube side fluids should not exceed 100 Fahrenheit, okay? Um, this is to right, avoid these stresses that cannot be tolerated and can damage your equipment. The other type of tube bundle is the U-tube bundle. And um, the main advantages, and as you can see, the name comes from the shape, right? It's a U-tube bundle. Uh, advantages, one of the uh, ends of the bundle is free to expand, right? Uh, the tube bundle can be removed and mechanically clean it because you have the whole thing like that, so you can take it out, right, and clean it. It's not fixed, it's not welded. Uh, disadvantages, more difficult to clean the inside tube. Why? Because of the curvature. It's difficult to clean. Uh, and also, you will need a larger shell required compared to a tube fix. Again, because of the curvature, your shell is going to be much bigger to enclose all that, uh, all, that, all that kind of geometry. We can have also the floating tube sheet. It's another type, it's a third type. And you can see here the image. One tube sheet is fixed and the other is free to float uh, within the shell. What are the advantages? Free expansion of the tube bundle, right? As you can see here, it's easy to see. Tube bundle is removable, allowing mechanical cleaning inside and outside the tube. So again, you can take out the bundle and clean. It's not fixed. Can be used for dirty service on both the tube side and the shell side. Well, because of this space, right? These advantages, this one is costly. And you can accommodate figure tubes in a given diameter shell. Uh, as we already uh, said, the Tubular Exchanger Manufacturer Association, TEMA, set the standards for construction and naming the shell and tube heat exchangers. And in this table, you can see um, how to nominate these shell and tube heat exchangers, right, or these heat exchangers. So a code, they develop a code of heat exchanger nomenclature, and the code consists of three letters one from the first column, another for the second column, and a third one for the third column, right? So you can see, if you look at this image, and you have this image there in the chapter 12, how to name a heat exchanger according to the TEMA standards. For example, 
the B E M. B comes from the first column, bonnet cover, E, one pass shell, M, fixed tube sheet. Okay? So that's how you name it according to the code, the T E M A code from the previous uh, table. So let's look at the B E M version. This is a popular version since the head can be removed to clean the inside of the tube. The front head piping must be unbolted to allow the removal of the front head and chemical cleaning required for outside the tube. Another type is the AEM, -M, A -E -M, sorry, channel with removable cover, one pass shell, fixed tube sheet bonnet. Again, from where I got all these things from the previous, from this previous um, um, slide. Um, this is almost the same type of the heat exchangers as the BEM. The removable cover allows the inside of the tubes to, ex to be inspected and cleaned without unbolting the front head piping. So one you bolt and the other you don't need to unbolt. So this is just to show you how they are named by the TEM code. This is the steps that you need to follow to design a heat exchanger. And you have all these steps also in your chapter 12, so don't worry about that. And we are going to solve a problem following all these steps, okay? There are 14 steps, but in reality there are more because you need to check within the steps that you are agreeing with what the person that, give, um, that uh, gives you the task to design a heat exchanger is required. For example, if it requires I don't need more than 1.14 PSI in the shell. If your design is giving more than that, you need to correct within your design until you get the pressure that you are requested. Okay, so essentially these are the, these 14 steps, but in reality you will be finishing with more steps because you need to iterate and correct through the way. So first of all, you need to establish your heat balance. Then assign the tube and shell streams. That's part of your job, to tell which fluid is going to go through the tube, which fluid is going to go through the shell. Uh, you need to establish a thermal diagram, uh, set the number of shells in the series, calculate the corrected mean temperature difference. Why corrected? Because this is a shell and tube. In shell and tube, we need to get a correction factor, remember? Choose the tube diameter, the thickness, the material, the length, and the pattern. That's part of your job. That's why when you design a heat exchanger, you get what you design for. Um, you estimate the film and fluid and fulling coefficients. Film and fluid coefficients means, film means convective heat transfer coefficients, and the fulling coefficients is what we already revised, right? Uh, calculate the overall heat transfer coefficient. Calculate estimate surface area of the equipment. Select the shell size. Calculate tube side pressure and reset tube passes to meet allowable pressure drop. This is when the iteration starts to come until you meet the allowable pressure drop or the required pressure drop. Assume baffle pitch and cut to meet allowable shell side and pressure drop. And in the beginning, you need to play a little bit with these values because it's going to be um, your first design of a heat exchanger. So you need to start proposing values. Like we said, like for liquids, we can have a full cut between 20 and 25. So you need to start like maybe with 25, but if that does give you, doesn't give you the lowered pressure, you need to change it and change it and change it until you have the lowered pressure. Um, recalculate the tube side and shell uh, heat transfer coefficient based on mass velocities available. Calculate the revised overall coefficient and check if sufficient surface is provided. If not, you need to recalculate the coefficient. And if surface available is too large or too small, you revisit the shell size and repeat steps 10 to 13. So uh, don't worry, we will go through a problem so you can see how it is done. Um, we need to check uh, a few tricks that might help you with the design of heat exchanger. So when designing a heat exchanger, how to increase the heat transfer? Because it's something that we want that happens, right? Uh, we can increase the heat transfer coefficient, we can increase the surface area, and we can increase the LMTD correction factor. So we have these three, these three main uh, ways to increase the heat, trans the heat transfer. How to increase the heat transfer coefficients? In the tube side, by decrease 
in the tube diameter or by increase in the number of tube passes. In the shell size, by decrease the baffle spacing or by decreasing the baffle cut. How to increase the heat, tran the heat transfer by increasing the surface area? Well, you can increase the tube length, uh, but you need to be careful. So your design is um, actually practical, right? You're not going to put a tube length of 100 like we were saying last class. You can increase the shell diameter or increase the, that will increase the number of tubes or allow you to increase the number of tubes. You can employ multiple shells in series or in parallel. How you can increase the heat transfer by increasing the LMT correction factor? Well, you can use contour current configuration or use multiple shell configuration. When designing how to reduce the pressure drop, and I told you this is a very common problem that you will face. Sometimes your pressure drop might be higher than whatever the designer requires to you. So how could you can do this? Well, in the tube side, you can decrease the number of tube passes. You can increase the tube diameter. You can decrease the tube length and increase the shell diameter and number of tubes. And in the shell side, you can increase the baffle cut, increase the baffle spacing, increase the tube pitch, or use double or triple segmented baffles. So as you can see, these are just guidelines and recommendations, and you will find much more in your chapter 12 that will help you to solve your design of heat exchanger. So the step one was to set up a heat balance, the step one to solve a heat exchanger. And um, heat, a heat balance, heat input to cold fluid minus heat input to hot fluid plus heat loss equals zero, or heat input to the cold fluid equals heat input to the hot equals the heat duty. That is the balance that we have been working with, right? So this table gives you more or less an idea of how to start solving for different cases, okay? It's just to give you an idea. You don't have to uh, follow this table like strictly. So for example, if you are given the stream IDs, the flow rates, the inlet and outlet temperatures, what you need, uh, you need a specific heat, latent heat from tables. And what, what you start doing is to calculate the heat transfer rate based on both streams. If you are given this, you need this, and this is how you can start. If you are given this, this is what you need, and this is how you can start. So it's a guideline only, okay? <clears throat> Another important term that you will read a lot now that we are going to start with uh, the evaluation of design of heat exchangers is the approach. And the approach point in a heat exchanger is the point where the temperature of the two streams come closer together, okay? For example, uh, here in a co-current flow, always this is going to happen at the outlet, at the outlet end, okay? Uh, so because this is going to be, this is the outlet end, so this is the in, the in cold, right? Because the temperature is lower, and this is the hot stream in. So the hot stream in is here, the cold stream in is here. And the approach is where the two temperatures of the two stream comes, comes closest together. That is what we define as the approach. So what is going to be the approach here in this counter current flow? Here. What is going to be here? In this condensing pure fluid, here. Here, here, here. So that's the approach. Um, so when, the, when there is only, only sensible heat transfer, uh, the approach is at the cold end. And just to give you a recall of what is sensible heat that I'm sure you revise a lot in your uh, thermo class is the energy required to change the temperature of substance with no phase change, right? So this is just to um, check this new term, the approach, because we will see it a lot. And this is a very simple, Simplified plot of the relationship, be relationship between the approach and the heat exchanger size and cost, right? So if our approach is very small, or the two temperatures are closer, how is going to be our heat exchanger? The more fine delta T you want, the more costly, and the larger. So this is a relationship. So the 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 more difference between the delta T's the smaller size and the cheapest one. But we always want this one. 
we always want to have a very fine approach. And it's our job to reduce this trade off, right? It's our job to have a fine approach with relative low cost and relative low area. That's what we always target when designing a heat exchanger. What are economical approaches in Fahrenheit? So as I already mentioned, most of the theory on heat exchangers is in English system, right? So these are some economic approach for several applications and you have uh, more tables in your chapter 12. And it's something that you always need to revise when designing a heat exchanger. For example, for cryogenic units such as liquid air plants, the approach, an economic approach, is five to 10 Fahrenheit. Water cool heat exchangers, 15 to 25. Oil to oil heat exchangers, 40 to 50. Convection section of a furnace, 75 to 100. So once you calculate your approach, you have to check that you, if you are in the economic, um, in the in the economic uh, range for for the approach. The step two could be to select which fluid is going to go through the shell and which fluid is going to go through the tubes. And here are some general guidelines of how to place one fluid in the shell and one fluid in the tubes. You have more again in your chapter 12. Typically, higher pressure fluid should be in the tubes. Corrosive fluids go in the tubes, right? And we already explained that. Because if we have a leak, it's going to be contained in the shell, so we have time to solve the situation. Uh, fully fluid go in the tubes. We can clean the tubes by brushing or water jetting cleaning of the inside of the tubes is easier than open up the bundle and cleaning the outside of the tubes. Toxic fluid should go in the tubes for containment. If pressure drop is a controlling factor, more control of pressure drop is available on the shell side. So the low pressure drop fluid should be put in the shell. Condensing fluids usually go in the shell. Um, put the streams with the lower mass flow rate in the tubes. This increases velocities and heat transfer coefficients. So again, uh, this is how you decide for fluid routing. And this is something that you might need to do uh, in your design of heat exchangers. 